Hello, right. and welcome back to Onward with Scott Chesney. Uh, today's guest, uh, I'm so honored to be able to interview Erica Colston, who is president and co-owner of Walk the Line and also a C6, C7 quadriplegic. Erica, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. No, thank you for being on the program with us. So much to offer Walk the Line, but you've had a pretty extraordinary life too, is that it's been almost 21 years now that you've been paralyzed as a result of a car accident. Can you take us through as much as you remember about that accident and also the, the days and weeks following in the hospital and rehabilitation center? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the time of my injury um, in 2001, I was 23 years old um, and I was visiting my family um, here in the Detroit area and for a party, family party. And my brother and I went out late uh, that night. Um, he wanted a snack. And so I figured I'd join him. Um, unfortunately, on the way home, he lost control of the vehicle in my parents' neighborhood. We went off the road, um, rolled. Um, and next thing you know, um, I, I remember distinctly because his car was a, a convertible. And even though the top was was up when we landed, the top had been torn away and I could see the stars, um, you know, which I thought was really interesting. Like what just happened? Um, and he was standing above me and I thought, why can't I, why can't I move? Um, nothing was really clicking right away. Um, but certainly in the days following, you know, everything was, was explained to me and I, and I realized what had happened. And I, um, it's a C6, C7, um, quadriplegic from, from that point on. So those days, beginning days in the hospital and rehabilitation center, I don't know if you were told certain things by doctors, what you would be able to do, not be able to do. Um, where were your spirits back then? Where was your mindset, would you say? Um, you know, I think, you know, as anyone that lives through this, you know, will probably say is that the first couple of weeks, especially you're in shock. Um, not just physical shock, you're sort of in like mental, emotional shock. Um, you know, my parents, I'm fortunate to have a very strong, supportive family. Um, what, what I initially felt um, once stabilized and once I was at the, the rehab hospital where I would stay for the duration of my, my inpatient experience um, was a lot of, um, a lot of like, perception onto me of what I would be capable of based off of my injury level. There wasn't a lot of room for, um, I, I didn't feel like anyone was speaking to me as an individual necessarily or listening to my hopes, my feelings. It was really all about like, I felt like it was really all about, is she getting that this is not going to happen again? Right, it's all about the realization of what's not going to be possible anymore. Um, and at that point, I just wasn't, that's just not what I wanted to hear. Um, and the more I didn't want to hear it, the more they wanted to say it. And so, um, you know, it was very difficult, very difficult first three months for me. I remember distinctly when I was leaving the hospital and going to an inpatient facility closer to my home, I remember thinking, you know, I'm going to start fresh and go and meet my new therapist. Um, and, and we're going to have an understanding from the beginning of what I want to get out of therapy and, and what that person can offer me and how we're going to go forward. And, you know, I felt like it was a much more productive situation, um, because I do feel like there is this, um, limitation on allowing people to have hope, right? It's like, this idea of like, you can have hope as long as it's realistic hope. Um, and, I, and I don't feel like there's a lot of room for, um, for that individualized treatment that of not only the physical body, but the mental and emotional body and what you're going through. And that's what I really feel like if, if things would have been a little bit different um, from that perspective in the beginning, I think I wouldn't have lost as much of that first initial ground as, as I feel like I did. I needed to hear everything they were telling me. I needed to learn everything they wanted to teach me. I really did. Looking back on it, I realized that, but just the way that, the way that it was presented just felt so based off of a diagnosis and not based off of me as a person. 
sounds like we're creating momentum for my next question and the birth <laughs> of something much bigger than a rehabilitation center, so to speak, in terms of walk the line. Um, everything that you're sharing right now, I have to think was absolutely part of the path that you needed to take that was going to bring about the creation and birth of walk the line. Um, is that kind of what happened? Exactly. You know, I, I remember one night, um, actually in, during my inpatient stay, my father and I were up, you know, one night talking and we dreamed of this place where people with spinal cord injuries could go and, um, pursue their recovery and be pushed physically and, um, and mentally and emotionally. And there would be wheelchairs and devices hanging from the ceiling when people didn't need them anymore. And, uh, you know, I went through a series of other programs before we, we started walk the line and each one gave me a little bit, you know, I took a little bit from each place, um, community involvement, um, physical, um, fitness and, and really feeling like, um, like I was in a place where I could not only push myself, but I could be pushed by other people physically to do things that maybe I didn't even think I could do. And all of these things led us to this point where I was like, okay, now it's time to do it on our own, kind of our own way. No place was really the, the perfect place for me. Um, and so that's why we started Walk the Line, to be that place, um, specifically for me. And then what we realized was say, that it was, were you like the test dummy? I, I wanted to put that. Exactly. I'm always, the, I'm always the test dummy. Um, and how, sure. did, how did you benefit in the beginning? Because obviously you went through the rehabilitation process and obviously, and still to this day, there are challenges with that system that are in place. And some of it has to do with insurance purposes and others just have to do with protocol. But you, how did you benefit yourself in a C6, C7 quadriplegic, where did you see advances made in your own personal care? Um, so definitely over the years, lots of advances in upper extremity strength, trunk control, even um, lower extremity tone and activation. While I still use a wheelchair day to day to get around, it has helped me to not only be healthier, but also function better in my environment to be stronger and to be able to do more. Um, you know, I had my son seven years ago and I feel like I worked my whole, my whole recovery time up until that point, just to be in such a good place to, to experience that as, as a quadriplegic woman. Um, and then working to regain function and strength after that. Um, so I think there's a lot of benefit, not just um, in that maintenance perspective, but I have seen over the years, not just in myself, but in many of our clients, that recovery does happen. If you put the body in the position that it wants to be in, um, the muscles do activate and you can retrain that nervous system. Um, will you recover completely from that? No, but I feel like with what Amrit is doing, with what some of the other technology is doing, we can marry those two things together. When you have um, the technology, the drive, and the expertise of physical therapists, um, you can really move things forward. Tell, tell us how you, because I, I know you're a big advocate for new advances, and I know a big advocate for Onwards technology and the products and the process that they have coming out. Tell us with regards to your own personal situation, because I, and I know we've spoken before about your excitement, whether it be blood pressure regulation, um, what the spinal stimulation does in creating noise in the spinal cord, get really excited talking about this. And I know you're thinking about your clients there at Walk the Line benefiting from this, but there's also a part of you that's like, hey, this is going to benefit me as well. Take us through those feelings that you've been feeling. Yeah, I mean, I think that, as so many people in our community probably feel is that, especially if we've been injured for a long time, um, is that we've seen things come through the pipelines, be talked about and not really feel like they're ever gonna be for you um, or that they're ever gonna be real. Um, and this feels real and it feels like it could help me. Um, and, and that's really exciting um, because I think that one of the things I've learned probably um, not just for my spinal cord injury, but as just a person is to allow myself to evolve and grow over time and to realize that 
um, different things can be important to me through the span of my life. Um, and aging as a quadriplegic is not exactly what I imagined it would be. It's, it's very difficult. Um, so to, to find a technology that could help with that but also see me through a progression is really promising. And I have to tell you, I've definitely been talking about Onward's technology amongst our clients and, and a lot of them are really excited about it. Um, I'm really excited about the possibility um, for what it could bring to them and how it could impact their lives. I, I could not agree more with you. And just to let you know, to aging as a paraplegic is very trying as well. <laughs> so we're both in the same boat. Um, what does that mean though? Because we both have witnessed a lot of clinical trials and again, all with the best of intention, but that's kind of where they, where it stops. What do you think of those clinical trials now and, and like products um, uh, being developed that are going to come to market that people can use at home and continue on with their care? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, like with anything else, the proof is in the pudding, right? I mean, we've all heard so many times about the different technologies that are going to come to the market that are going to help us do this, that, or the other thing again. Um, it's really about getting, involving the community and, and having something that actually is accessible to people um, and not just people with a lot of money that can pay for it, but people with insurance, people with different um, funding mechanisms. Um, and also I think encouraging that technology to be used early on. You know, if you think about the initial inpatient experience, the only thing that's really different now from 20 years ago is that th it's about half the time. You know, I spent three months in the hospital and now, you know, um, someone with my injury might spend six to eight weeks. So we really have to work to not only make these, this new technology accessible to people like myself, but making sure that in the hospital, when those injuries are fresh, we're doing what we can to promote the most recovery possible um, and using the technology that we have to do that. Absolutely. Now, Erica, knowing that there are no two spinal cord injuries alike, uh, you put all of our MRIs up on a screen, there's no, there's no two that are alike. Um, knowing full well what this noise that they call it in the, the spinal cord through spinal stimulation can create, where would you rank personally yourself with regards to what would be of greatest impact for you with regards to return? I meant for some people it's standing, some people it's walking, sometimes it's bladder, it's bowels, it's blood pressure regulation. Where would you rank those with regards to your own individual um, preference? Well, I like to say, it's funny you bring that up. I like to say that we're like snowflakes, right? Cause we're all, we're all completely unique. Um, I think for me, definitely the blood pressure regulation is, is a big one, um, especially as, as I age and things change. Um, bladder and bowel function, it's like, how do you even put them in order? Um, you know, the, definitely the bladder and bowel function is really important to me. That would free up a lot of, um, independence um, and reliance that I have on caregivers. Um, the upper extremity function, the trunk control are also really important. That's not to say that standing or walking isn't important to me, but I think as I've lived life um, with a spinal cord injury, that's become less of a priority for me. I, whereas once, I guess when I was first injured, I, I really tied walking and standing to like quality of life. And I've seen that I can be a productive person and I can be a happy person without that. That doesn't mean that it wouldn't be great to do that or I wouldn't love to, um, to be, you know, in a, a standing position or walking down the hallway or, or anything. Um, but, it be, but putting in perspective, it's probably a little less important to me at this point. It's interesting how the able-bodied community sees those as being the most important, the walking and the standing, but the hidden parts of the disability, uh, which you've discussed, are the ones that are truly meaningful. Erica, th this has been an absolute joy, and I know that we're going to be talking much more down the road um, and want to wish Walk the Line and you personally all the success. If people want to find out more about Walk the Line, what's the best way to reach you? Uh, they can go to our website, wtlrecovery.com. There's an email address for me there, um, our phone number. So however people want to reach us, um, we also have Facebook and Instagram, of course, LinkedIn. 
Fantastic, fantastic. Well, Erica, thank you so much and best of luck in your life. Best of luck to walk the line. And again, we'll be talking to you more down the road.